interplanetary spaceships, and the Lubbock series was one of these reports. The fact that the formations of lights were in different shapes didn't bother them. In fact, it convinced them all the more that their ideas of how a spaceship might operate were correct. This group of scientists believed that the spaceships, or at least the part of the spaceship that came relatively close to the Earth, would have to have a highly swept back wing configuration. And they believed that for propulsion and control, the craft had a series of small jet orifices all around its edge. Various combinations of these small jets would be turned on to get various flight attitudes. The lights that the various observers saw differed in arrangement because the craft was flying in different flight attitudes. Three years later, the Canadian government announced that this was exactly the way that they had planned to control the flying saucer that they were trying to build. They had to give up their plans for the development of the saucer-like craft, but now the project has been taken over by the U.S. Air Force. This is the complete story of the Lubbock Lights as it is carried in the Air Force files, one of the most interesting and most controversial collection of UFO sightings ever to be reported to Project Blue Book. Officially, all of the sightings, except the UFO that was picked up on radar, are unknown. Personally, I thought that the professor's lights might have been some kind of birds reflecting the light from mercury vapor street lights, but I was wrong. They weren't birds, they weren't reflected light, but they weren't spaceships. The lights that the professors saw, the backbone of the Lubbock Light Series, have been positively identified as a very commonplace and easily explainable natural phenomenon. It is very unfortunate that I can't divulge exactly the way the answer was found because it is an interesting story of how a scientist set up complete instrumentation to track down the lights and how he spent several months testing theory after theory until he finally hit upon the answer. Telling the story would lead to his identity and, in exchange for his story, I promised the man complete anonymity but he fully convinced me that he had the answer, and after having heard hundreds of explanations of UFOs, I didn't convince easily. With the most important phase of the Lubbock Lights solved, the sightings by the professors, the other phases become only good UFO reports. End of chapter eight. Recording by Roger Moline. Chapter 9 of The Report on Unidentified Flying Objects. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Roger Moline. The Report on Unidentified Flying Objects by Edward Ruppel. Chapter 9 The New Project Grudge. While I was in Lubbock, Lieutenant Henry Metcher, who was helping me on Project Grudge, had been sorting out the many bits and pieces of information that Lieutenant Jerry Cummings and Lieutenant Colonel Rosengarten had brought back from Fort Monmouth, New Jersey, and he had the answers. The UFO that the student radar operator had assumed to be traveling at a terrific speed because he couldn't lock onto it, turned out to be a 400 mile an hour conventional airplane. He'd just gotten fouled up on his procedures for putting the radar set on automatic tracking. The sighting by the two officers in the T-33 jet fell apart when Metcher showed how they'd seen a balloon. The second radar sighting of the series also turned out to be a balloon. The frantic phone call from headquarters requesting a reading on the object's altitude was to settle a bet. Some officers in headquarters had seen the balloon launched and were betting on how high it was. The second day's radar sightings were caused by another balloon and weather, both enhanced by the firm conviction that there were some mighty queer goings-on over Jersey. 
The success with the Fort Monmouth incident had gone to our heads, and we were convinced that with a little diligent digging we'd be knocking off saucers like an ace skeet shooter. With all the confidence in the world, I attacked the Long Beach incident, which I'd had to drop to go to Lubbock, Texas. But if saucers could laugh, they were probably zipping through the stratosphere chuckling to themselves, because there was no neat solution to this one. In the original report of how the six F-86s chased the high-flying UFO over Long Beach, the intelligence officer who made the report had said that he'd checked all aircraft flights, therefore this wasn't the answer. The UFO could have been a balloon, so I sent a wire to the Air Force weather detachment at the Long Beach Municipal Airport. I wanted the track of any balloon that was in the air at 7.55 a.m. on September 23, 1951. While I was waiting for the answers to my two wires, Lieutenant Metcher and I began to sort out old UFO reports. It was a big job because back in 1949, when the old project just been dumped into storage bins. Hank and I now had four filing case drawers full of a heterogeneous mass of UFO reports, letters, copies of letters, and memos. But I didn't get to do much sorting because the mail girl brought in a copy of a wire that had just arrived. It was a report of a UFO sighting at Terre Haute, Indiana. I read it and told Metcher that I'd quickly whip out an answer and get back to helping him sort, but it didn't prove to be that easy. The report from Terre Haute said that on October 9th, a CAA employee at Holman Municipal Airport had observed a silvery UFO. Three minutes later, a pilot flying east of Terre Haute had seen a similar object. The report lacked many details, but a few phone calls filled me in on the complete story. At 1.43 p.m. on the 9th, a CAA employee at the airport was walking across the ramp in front of the administration building. He happened to glance up at the sky, why he didn't know, and out of the corner of his eye he caught a flash of light on the southeastern horizon. He stopped and looked at the sky where the flash of light had been, but he couldn't see anything. He was just about to walk on when he noticed what he described as a pinpoint of light in the same spot where he'd seen the flash. In a second or two, the pinpoint grew larger, and it was obvious to the CAA man that something was approaching the airport at a terrific speed. As he watched, the object grew larger and larger until it flashed directly overhead and disappeared to the northwest. The CAA man said that it all happened so fast, and he was so amazed, that he hadn't called anybody to come out of the nearby hangar and watch the UFO. But when he'd calmed down, he remembered a few facts. The UFO had been in sight for about 15 seconds, and during this time, it had passed from horizon to horizon. It was shaped like a flattened tennis ball, was a bright silver color, and when it was directly overhead, it was the size of a 50-cent piece held at arm's length. But this wasn't all there was to the report. A matter of minutes after the sighting, a pilot radioed Terre Haute that he had seen a UFO. He was flying from Greencastle, Indiana to Paris, Illinois, when just east of Paris he'd looked back into his left. There, level with his airplane and fairly close, was a large silvery object, like a flattened orange, hanging motionless in the sky. He looked at it a few seconds, then hauled his plane around in a tight left bank. He headed directly toward the UFO, but it suddenly began to pick up speed and shot off toward the northeast. The time, by the clock on his instrument panel, was 1.45 p.m., just two minutes after the sighting at Terre Haute. When I finished calling, I got an aeronautical chart out of the file and plotted the points of the sighting. The CAA employee had seen the UFO disappear over the northwestern horizon. 
the pilot had been flying from Greencastle, Indiana to Paris, Illinois, so he'd have been flying on a heading of just a little less than 270 degrees, or almost straight west. He was just east of Paris when he'd first seen the UFO, and since he said that he'd looked back and to his left, the spot where he saw the UFO would be right at the spot where the CAA man had seen his UFO disappear. Both observers had checked their watches with radio time just after the sightings, so there couldn't be more than a few seconds discrepancy. All I could conclude was that both had seen the same UFO. I checked the path of every balloon in the Midwest. I checked the weather. It was a clear, cloudless day. I had the two observers' backgrounds checked, and I even checked for air traffic, although I knew the UFO wasn't an airplane. I researched the University of Dayton Library for everything on daylight meteors, but this was no good. From the description the CAA employee gave, what he'd seen had been a clear-cut, distinct, flattened sphere with no smoke trail, no sparks, and no tail. A daylight meteor, so low as to be described as a 50-cent piece held at arm's length, would have had a smoke trail, sparks, and would have made a roar that would have jolted the Sphinx. This one was quiet. Besides, no daylight meteor stops long enough to let an airplane turn into it. Conclusion? Unknown. In a few days, the data from the Long Beach incident came in, and I started to put it together. A weather balloon had been launched from the Long Beach airport, and it was in the vicinity where the six F-86s had made their unsuccessful attempt to intercept a UFO. I plotted out the path of the balloon, the reported path of the UFO, and the flight paths of the F-86s. The paths of the balloon and the F-86s were accurate, I knew, because the balloon was being tracked by radio fixes, and the F-86s had been tracked by radar. At only one point did the paths of the balloon, UFO, and F-86s coincide. When the first two F-86s made their initial visual contact with the UFO, they were looking almost directly at the balloon. But from then on, even by altering the courses of the F-86s, I couldn't prove a thing. In addition, the weather observers from Long Beach said that during the period that the intercept was taking place, they had gone outside and looked at their balloon. It was an exceptionally clear day, and they could see it at unusually high altitudes. They didn't see any F-86s around it. And one stronger point, the balloon had burst about 10 minutes before the F-86. Lieutenant Metcher took over and, riding on his Fort Monmouth victory, tried to show how the pilots had seen the balloon. He got the same thing I did. Nothing. On October 27, 1951, the new Project Grudge was officially established. I'd written the necessary letters and had received the necessary endorsements. I'd estimated, itemized, and justified direct costs and manpower. I'd conferred, inferred, and referred, and now I had the money to operate. The next step was to pile up all this paperwork as an aerial barrier, let the saucers crash into it, and fall just outside the door.